Hi, I am your host, Kinara San Kofa, and this is Education in the Community. And today I've decided to call this particular show The Vast Beauty of Art. And we have a very powerful, interesting, and phenomenal artist here with us to share some of his great art with us. I'd like to introduce you to my man, friend, brother, William Rhodes. Welcome to the show, William. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Ah, it's good to see you here. And I see that you brought some wonderful pieces with you. Uh, let me ask you, William, first off, what got you into creating this beautiful art with us? What started you off? Well, my journey uh, <laughs> goes pretty far back, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm dating myself at least 30-some years. Wow. Um, started off with uh, really finding myself as a, as a child, very small child, mm -hmm. you know, I was small in stature mm -hmm. compared to uh, many of my peers in my neighborhood. Okay. And uh, I, would, I was interested in playing sports, but because I was so small, I was like the run in some way, right, right, being pushed right. around mm -hmm. and having a very difficult time to keep up with the bigger kids. Mm -hmm. And I found that I would spend my time drawing many times, mm -hmm. and I started to draw, it started off as drawing sports figures, mm -hmm. these heroes that I really right. wanted to become as an athlete. Mm -hmm. But then it became like my, my own world, my escape in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I spent hours just drawing and just, you know, finding myself just be, be falling in love with the whole process of creating art, creating these characters, mm -hmm. and just, you know. So when produce. did you, how, how old were you at this time? Do you remember when you, did you grow in love with this art or did it grow on you? Um, so what age do you recall going back into the artistic side of yourself? I would say five years old, and, and the only wow. reason why I was able to date that is because I found some old drawings that I mm -hmm. did, and I had the dates on the drawings. So that was around five. I was five, five. years of age. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, we're, we're talking about stick figures and and you know. It's still, <laughs> I mean, but that's art. That's the creative side. So mm -hmm. you could you could take it back all the way back to five years of age. Yeah. Wow, that's a beautiful thing. So did you actually go to school to learn, um, to become who you are, to develop into the who you are at this moment? Did you go to have to go to school to learn? Because a lot of our kids today uh, who are creative, they don't have this sort of stuff in schools. They've kind of moved some of this out of the way. So did you actually go to school to learn? Yeah, very fortunate. I got accepted in uh, Baltimore School for the Arts, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a, a high school. Uh, finished mm -hmm. and four years and then from there I went to University Arts in Philadelphia where I got my bachelor's degree in mm -hmm. um, in art mm -hmm. and furniture making. Furniture? Uh-huh and then from there I went to graduate school at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and continued making art and furniture making but then my furniture started to take more of a sculptural move. It started to move from traditional wow. To more artistic furniture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, is that where this creative side of you blending in the painting and the sculpturing kind of took place? Yeah. And, and so uh, is this a natural thing, would you say by yourself, that uh, you just picked up naturally and you just roll with it? Or did you have someone, a mentor, someone there to show you, teach you about the creative side that was brought outside of you? Because everything is inside. Exactly. And then it just comes out, or you had someone to actually uh, pull it out of you, would you say? I, I would say it was a combination of both. Um, okay. there, there were definitely huge inspirations um, and also mentors. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of a mentor by the name of Joyce Scott. She uh, was an amazing mentor. Um, some of my furniture teachers, uh, Alphonse Mattia, um, mm -hmm. Stephen Whittlesley, all of them were, mm -hmm. were amazing teachers, but they inspired me and, and really saw something in me to mm -hmm. help pull out, you know, my voice through, right. through my art. Be through the arts mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. And you're from Baltimore, right? Yes. Can you uh -huh. give us a little, a little history about you growing up in Baltimore? Um, I wouldn't say it was, you know, we call it the hood these days. Mm -hmm. And many of our neighborhoods, they said the neighbor is not so much anymore neighborly. And yeah. so we call, we said it's the hood. Growing up, 
back then um, in, in, in Baltimore and this creative side and the arts to where you are now, would you say that um, uh, living in Baltimore, uh, growing up in the neighborhood, um, being associated with other youth that may not have had that creative side as you did and or they did, mm -hmm. what was the culprit that really got you pulled into this zone of creating such beautiful art? Well, really, you know, my father was a big inspiration. My father was an artist mm -hmm. um, as wow. well. He didn't pursue it as a career mm -hmm. because, you know, he got married. They had me and my father wanted to be the provider, which he was, a great provider. Okay. So he worked a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. Less time to produce any art, but he always had still the love for it. Mm -hmm. And so he encouraged me to continue to do art along with my, my mother. Good. That's um, beautiful. That's beautiful. In Baltimore, I literally witnessed the change. The um, Baltimore was a blue was a blue collar city, mm -hmm. very industrial, hardworking people going to factories, working on Bethlehem steel steel mills, and then I I literally witnessed all of that leaving the city. You know those wow. jobs leaving the city, mm -hmm. and then those things being replaced with the crack cocaine epidemic. Wow! Oh, so you were able to witness some of these things. Literally. literally, I mean, I literally remember seeing the change. You wow! Know, literally seeing overnight, and it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but literally watching communities change overnight. From, you know, my grandparents would go out of town; they would leave the key with the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would mm -hmm. leave the doors unlocked. Right. With the neighbor. Right. And literally, that's almost you know that changed overnight to a point where it was unheard of. Well, what do you attribute that to? Uh, hmm. Do you think there, we see the effect, we don't deal with the cause. Do you believe there was a cause for that shifting uh, in your perception or in your opinion? Uh, if you do, please, yeah. I'd like for you to uh, express that. Well, I meant, you know, people that, that study human engineering <laughs> and, and the human mind and, mm -hmm. and social engineering, they understand that. If you take away certain things and you replace them with something else, you're mm -hmm. going to get a certain effect. Mm -hmm. And if all the jobs are taken out of a community and you really don't give people options mm -hmm. and you replace them with drugs and also if you, if you make it seem very appealing, which right. in the beginning... I think that's what one of the things it is. In the beginning, that was an appealing thing. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, I, I remember seeing 14-year-old kids riding <clears> around in, you know, amazing cars, owning condos at 14. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the case necessarily mm -hmm. now, but mm -hmm. in the early stages of that epidemic, it became the thing. You didn't have that blue collar job, but hey, you can make thousands. Exactly, by selling drugs and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and another thing that I noticed is, uh, we were talking about the arts, is they pulled the arts, they crafts, yeah. out of the schools. I remember going you know, the school here at Castlemont High, just, just one of them. And um, you had wood shop, you had metal shop, you had all these various different skills that you can learn from school. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that today? Because I believe you work with uh, young uh, youth today. I do. Okay. Um, I'm seeing the emphasis now is more after school programs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, teachers come in, art teachers, music teachers, wood shop teachers, et cetera, they come in more as an after school, after school enrichment program. It's not necessarily, at least in the schools that I work in, mm -hmm. it's not an emphasis. Can you get the skills though? Let me ask you this. When I was coming up, I knew that I could take a semester, a year of wood shop. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're prepared well to go out into the world and be a carpenter or electrician. Mm -hmm. With the after school that you're talking about, because it's what, probably from three to six, something of that nature, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the after school mm -hmm. programs. True. Can you get a lot out of the after school programs as much as what you were getting? No, you, you wouldn't get as much. Um, number one, a lot of schools, it's difficult for them to find spaces for people. So you know, say a wood shop, you need a dedicated space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's difficult in some schools. And many times you're coming into the school, bringing your materials, bringing the arts. 
So you need a place. You may actually have to work in a cafeteria. You may have to work in a room that a teacher will say, okay, it's okay to use, use this it. room for this particular yeah. day and time set, but then you have to move back into a regular classroom sort of a setting. Yeah. How, how does that affect someone like yourself and, and also the, the student themselves as well? It makes it difficult. Um, the positive out of it is it at least gives a student the possibility that they can pursue this further. So when I come in, if I see a really gifted student, mm -hmm. they may not get the time that they would ordinarily get for an art class or mm -hmm. whatever. But the fact is I'm giving them a small little snippet right. and I'm right. hoping that that's creating a spark inside of them right. where they decide to pursue it on their own or come to me later on and say, hey, Mr. Rhodes, you know, uh, where can I learn more or are there any other programs? Or sometimes I offer things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So so I'm hoping that it, it creates it can, the that. spark yeah. that, that can generate something inside of the spirit of the person. Mm -hmm. Do you think the arts help the spirit um, to rest easier when you have this creative side about you? Color, you know, I'm looking at this piece here as a matter of fact, and I'd like you to discuss this. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's bright, it's, it's, uh, it's ma I call it magical, but um, it's, it's incredible. Could you explain right. to our, our viewers about this particular piece, please? So, so this piece, basically, um, you know, when you look at it, you know, it is obviously the sky and the mm -hmm. universe, but it's a much deeper story. I actually uh, took a trip to the Grand Canyon okay. about a year ago, year or so ago, and I was driving, went to the Grand Canyon, driving back to the hotel, and I got lost in the desert and <laughs> took the wrong turn. Right. And I don't know how many people have actually gotten lost in the desert at night. Right. I'm a city person, so it was a different experience <laughs> right. for me. Right. 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 I can hear you. And it was total fear, mm -hmm. total, you know, like I, I felt I had no control because I'm driving in darkness. The only lights mm. were from my car. And the one thing, it was like, almost like this weird little voice told me at some point, just look up at the sky. And I pulled over and I looked up. And when I looked at the sky, it was like something that I had never, ever seen before. It was as if it was, not only was it magical because mm -hmm. all of the stars and the mm -hmm. light and everything else, but it felt like it was alive. Wow. And it had a presence. And at that moment, I knew that this thing, or whatever you call mm -hmm. it, this sky, mm -hmm. actually, I was connected to it, and mm -hmm. it had a greater presence, an mm -hmm. intelligent presence, I felt. Mm. And that, seeing that calmed me down in many ways, and I was able to, you know, eventually find my way back to the hotel the next, pretty much in the morning. <laughs> right. um, but anyway, when I came back, you know, it inspired me to do a series of these paintings. This mm -hmm. is one of the paintings based yeah. on that. So. You can see the Grand Canyon, the yeah, mountains. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking there. At and the uh, bottom. But then this is the sky. And to me, I want the sky really to speak more than even the mountains, okay. although the mountains are amazing. Mm -hmm. That sky really, you know, spoke to me even more so than that landscaping around. Wow, and this came, I say there are never any accidents. You know, that um, situation that you came across uh, could have feared you for a long time, but you <laughs> took uh, the, the godliness within yourself and calmed your spirit. Yeah. And um, it's incredible, you say you looked up at the sky as though you were looking for some answer and your spirit within you told you to look up and then you were able to create. Uh, how long did it take you to create something of this nature? Well, this was, was of a series, so, so the way I work I may have three or four pieces okay. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was working on probably two paintings at the same time along okay. with this. Oh, really? So told, with both of those, it took me several months, I would say. Okay. And, but it would be back and forth. Back and forth. I okay. work, do a certain area in this painting, mm -hmm. and then, you know, say, well, maybe I need to come back to it. Then I start okay. working on the other canvas. Okay. So between the two, right. it, was, it was several months. Okay. And I see this beautiful piece of art here because you're a painter one that's one thing mm -hmm. about yourself mm -hmm. okay but then you flip the script and you mm -hmm. come back 
uh, because I remember you said earlier that uh, you did uh, uh, furniture making. Yes. Okay, Th this is furniture, but I typically see furniture because my background is, mind you, is in office furniture. Mm -hmm. And this is f furniture. Yes. Please explain that piece there uh, to our audience because that is incredible. Um, I see it's, it's, there's this wood that's going on. You got the mirrors inside. I see the gold, mm -hmm. the color. Can you uh, elaborate a bit on that, please? So she's a carved wood piece. Okay. Um, the face is the natural grain of the wood. Get um, out of here. Yeah, the natural grain of the wood. This is the, this is the color of the wood. Um, I did paint her hair mm -hmm. and, the, and the snake form on the top and added the, the, the crown. Okay. But uh, she's, she could be considered a, a mini cabinet because there is a small niche which is cut on the inside at, at below, uh -huh. which has a label of God. Right, okay, I um, see, I see there. And I, so this, this is a functional piece. You know, it could be used as a small cabinet. I mean, it's absolutely incredible and it seems very heavy as well. Now, yeah. the crown that you speak of, that made out of uh, wood as well? Carved wood. It's carved, carved wood? Yeah, and I, I actually do a process where I take my chisel and cut uh, like little inserts, like okay. little um, pockets out, mm -hmm. and then I pop the mirror inside of those little pockets. Wow, that is incredible. So do you do any shows, actually, of showing your art? Uh, because uh, I, I'm positively sure with the beauty of such art that you are creating here, that um, you don't just have it sitting at home. Mm -hmm. So what do you, do you travel around um, the city? Uh, you're based here, uh, I believe in San Francisco, are you not? Yes, I'm in San okay. Francisco. So do you travel with any of your arts? You do any art gallery shows? I do. Um, recently, I was, I'm a part of a collective. I'm a co-founder of an African-American art collective called 3.9. Mm -hmm. And we did a huge exhibition, which was amazing, at uh, University of San Francisco in the Thatcher Gallery. Okay. Uh, that exhibition just ended, but personally, I, um, I do shows all over the country. I uh, was blessed to be invited to be in the um, Memphis, Tennessee Museum, which Get is called the Metal Museum uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Congratulations. Um, have exhibitions in Atlanta. I've shown sh shows, numerous shows in New York, Chicago, um, really everywhere. I'm okay. working on an ex 